It's often said that ships will pass in the night, and Lieutenant John Hebby thanks his lucky stars. They tend to do that. How do you do? My name is John Hebby. H-E-B-B-E, -E, rhymes with Debbie, which is what I tell the kids in school. Hebby, a decorated veteran of the Navy, Army, and Air Force, is now a substitute teacher full of stories. Oh, by the way, you ready? One more? Yes. But perhaps his favorite is from February 10th, 1960, when a stranger saved his life. If had he not jumped in, it would have been a different ending. Hebby was flying planes off the USS Saratoga, 70 miles west of Sicily, a pitch black night that eventually pitched his plane right off the boat. And I hit the water. Uh, the airplane sinking is never made to land in water. And I eventually got out. His flare caught the gasoline around him on fire, melting his dinghy as his suit filled with water, dragging him under. But from on board the USS Benham, rescue diver Marshall Beard was watching. And the searchlights was on him. I seen he was about exhausted and about to go under. So that's when I went overboard and got a line to him. In nothing but shorts and a t-shirt, Beard pulled the pilot to safety before being dragged in the water behind the ship until someone on deck took notice. Both the pilot and I had a guardian angel with us that night because I believe we wouldn't have made it if we didn't. Hebby has gone on to tell this story many times. You heard it today, it was a 3,000 and first time. But no one in Marshall Beard's family had heard the story until a few weeks ago. It's like finding out that your dad's Superman, you know? Um, he's a real hero. And so that's pretty cool, <laughs> you know? His daughter Lisa found a patch from a jacket given as a thank you gift from Hebby's carrier 60 years ago. All Beard remembered was a name and Lisa got to work tracking him down. And I says, is this the Lieutenant Hebby that I took a midnight swim with in the Mediterranean? And he must have had an answering machine. He could hear the voice. He picked it up and he said, say that again. <laughs> Hi, this is John Hebby. This is the guy you jumped in and saved. For Hebby, the few hours distance between them was nothing on a lifetime of memories. And so, for the first time in 60 years, oh, it is. the pilot and the diver meet again under far better circumstances. It's about time you got here. It's been 60 years. You look better than the last time I seen you. How are you, my friend? For Hebby, a chance to shake the hand of a man on a ship that was just in time. It wasn't just that I want to thank him, it's that from the bottom of my heart, he's been the door to the rest of my life. And for Beard, a chance to be grateful that ships sometimes pass each other once again. Probably was destiny that it was supposed to happen. I'm going to remember this day the rest of my life, as long as I have left. In Roanoke, Leanna Scacchetti, WDBJ7. Ella Buchanan is stressed. She's returned home to the family farm to help her aging parents and her thinning herd. Come on, girls! Today, she's feeding them grain and supplement. That's because her cows aren't as big as they need to be. Far before winter's arrival, there is hardly any green grass. And right now, Mother Nature needs to help me out. The last time Giles had a widespread soaking rain was late June. That means farmers like Buchanan and her friend Kelly Kidd are cutting into dwindling hay reserves months earlier than usual. Ponds are going dry. We have a lot of air farms that are fed by mountain springs and they're really low. Kidd says supplemental grains for the herd will be expensive and even that will likely have a domino effect on the year ahead. You know, if the cattle don't get the best quality hay or the best quality corn and they may not because of the drought this summer, then they may not breed back and we may not get, um, you know, the calves for next year. Buchanan takes me from her young neighbor's farm to Don Straley's farm. This is home and this is where my heart is. Straley isn't faring any better. He's down 100 tons of hay. Looking at probably seven or eight months of feeding and I don't have it and the neighbors don't either. If there's been a drought on the land, he says there's been a flood on the market. They're getting a fraction of what they once got for their cows, 10 to 15 percent less than last year by some estimates. He says this is the worst drought he's seen in 70 years. All the farmers I talk with are, are feeling the same way. We just kind of get quiet about it because we don't know how to handle it. But while the future is unclear, these farmers say there's no option but forward.
In Giles County, Leanna Scacchetti, WDBJ7. BJ 7s Leanna Scacchetti is live in Roanoke. Leanna, you've been looking into this because you noticed a local restaurant went out of business, right? That's right, Jean, and I found out that the owners were charged with embezzlement after not paying the taxes that they owed to the city, but they're not the only ones. And now that the treasurer is in charge, she's telling me she's just trying to do her job. The Roanoke has been in business for a long time. 78 years. The owner says success is an easy recipe. Good food. We try to keep the atmosphere nice. They also try to keep up with their taxes owed to the city. We were late one month because of circumstances we just forgot to pay and the penalty was high. That's the standard Treasurer Evelyn Powers is trying to set. It is the law. Since her office took over trust tax collections a year and a half ago, we're getting right on it. She's run a tight ship. When I took the office of oath as treasurer, it says I will uphold my responsibilities and that's just in, you know, what I'm trying to do. She's got reason for it too. Power says local restaurants owe the city nearly $300,000 in unpaid food and beverage taxes. She's allowing owners two months to get things in order. We want to help you. However, if you're not willing to help yourself and do what you need to do, my office cannot hold their hand. Plus, she says it's only fair. It is not right for us to have to pay in they don't pay. You have to pay taxes. Delinquent businesses are being turned over to the Commonwealth's attorney. In fact, court records show the owners of Mel's Place were recently indicted on charges of embezzlement and unpaid taxes. It is not an easy decision. But Power says not following the letter of the law is a recipe for disaster for the city. Power says the Roanoker is one of the businesses that consistently pays on time, but right now her office is working with about 40 of the city's 500 restaurants to get their balances paid on time. She has already had to turn over four yeah. restaurants to the Commonwealth's attorney, Jean. She also told us that uh, restaurants no longer in business still owe the city about $98,000 in unpaid yeah. taxes, and it's not always easy to get that money back. Right, and those are the taxes. Jean, we learned that Michael Brown's grandmother called police after she and her daughter, Brown's mother, reported hearing banging on their windows. They believed it was Brown. That call led police to close schools, put neighborhoods on lockdown, and enabled a widespread manhunt for a man who was not caught for another two weeks. Somebody was banging on the house here in the town out here. That is the voice of Diane Hansen, the grandmother of Michael Brown, who called police just after midnight, November 14th. She and her daughter, Vanessa, tell police they woke up to banging on their house. I think Michael Brown is here. Dispatch tells Hansen that police are on their way to search the neighborhood. Vanessa Hansen can be heard on the call as well, insisting that if it was her son, she needed to talk to him. I got to at least try. The only way to help him, the only thing I can do for him is that he's got to get him to turn himself in without getting shot. He won't hurt me. If it was him. I gotta talk to him. I gotta get him, get him, save my boy. Her mother, Diane, appears more concerned with their safety, less convinced Michael Brown wouldn't hurt them. Look what he's done. You don't know. This is not your baby. Stop saying that. Dispatch stays on the phone with the women for four and a half hours <laughs> until police eventually come to the door. But there's another voice in the background. They call Phoenix, they put up and wait for it. According to the call, Vanessa Hansen is speaking with an FBI agent on the phone. Later, the agent calls back with updates. Throughout the call, Vanessa insists she can convince Michael Brown to turn himself in only if she can speak with him for a few minutes. Diane Hansen insists that they cannot open the door for Michael Brown if it was him. Pray God will give him the courage to give himself up. Please, God. Gene, we know, of course, that Brown was not taken into custody that day. He was arrested without incident at his mother's home in Franklin County on November 27th, just before Thanksgiving. Right. It's still unclear at this point if he was the one banging on their windows and doors and whether he really did stay hidden in the RV. But again, up until this point, we did not know why police responded right. early that morning of November 14th uh, to Tilly Avenue.